Hello and welcome back to the third rail. I've been working on getting this pile of locomotives ready for a future video. They are all BR120s that share the same tooling. In the last episode, we looked at the oldest among them, we covered standard servicing steps and fixed a few minor issues here and there. This week, we'll hopefully complete the job for the remaining locomotives. As the basic servicing steps are identical across all of them, I will not cover them in detail here and concentrate instead on model specifics and faults I come across along the way. OK, let's make our way back to the bench. While we do this, I shall plug a quick ask. This time of the year is the quietest for the channel, so likes count even more than usual on YouTube. If you enjoy my content and would like to support the channel, I would greatly appreciate if you could give the video a thumbs up. It won't cost you anything and will help the channel, if not increase, at least maintain its visibility over the summer. You might even consider subscribing if you haven't already done so, which would also help a great deal. Many thanks in advance. Now let's return to our patience. So, we'll pick up where we left off with another locomotive in unknown condition. There it is. It is a 3653, so that's a digital model. It should be the same livery as the 3153 we looked at in the last episode. And it certainly looks similar from here. It was released a few years later though, so I think a few modifications were made for this version. Let me get it out of its box. Oh, we have instructions and everything else, that's cool. Yes, it does look a bit different. The roof has been reworked on this version, there's a few more power lines, and if we compare the liveries, the digital model is indeed a bit darker now. OK, let's start with a quick visual inspection. Overall, the model looks good cosmetically, we can see it has been used with overhead line before. Some of the blackening on the pantograph has rubbed off. That's normal wear and tear. As soon as you lift the pantograph to use it with an overhead line, this is what happens. It only takes a few meters. Looking at the chassis, everything is how it should be. Ah, we have blackened wheel on this model too. Not bad. OK, it's time for the customary function test dead. Now that's rather annoying. Yeah, not a good start. It would be very tempting to assume the decoder is dead now. But this model hasn't been used for a very long time, so the first thing to do here is to avoid panicking and carry out a few checks. So we're going to have a look inside. I'll spare you the opening, it's the same as in the previous video. And here is our chassis. It all looks original and in very good condition. We have a 6080 decoder with its dip switches. It's a second generation one. We can see that the overhead switch lever at the center is set to track operation. So it was in the right position for our test. That's a bit of a shame. That would have been a very simple fix. Let's look under the chassis now. I'll check the wheels on the motor bogey are free. Yep, no problem. Let me check the traction tires quickly. Loose, loose, loose and loose again. So we'll need a full set of them if we ever get this to run. Now, before engaging in any servicing, I'm going to try and see if I can get any sign of life from the decoder. So we'll start with a closer inspection of the decoder. There is no sign of any damage. All the components look intact. And the setup of the dip switches is not important here as this decoder automatically recognizes analog operations, whatever their position. The wiring and the solder joints all look original. And more importantly, everything looks intact. So what is next? For a decoder to be operational, we need a reliable source of current. Since it is provided by the track, we are going to check the front bogey. 
the wheels and pickup shoe look OK. But this model has been idle for a while, so there is a good chance something has oxidized there. The wheels are blackened, so it would be difficult to see as well. So I'm going to grab my track rubber and give the wheels a quick scrub. That's it. And I also give the pickup shoe a quick wipe with some alcohol. OK, let's put the model back on the track and see what happens now. Power. Aha, we have movement. It's not really stable or great, but we can also change the direction. So the decoder must be operational. Things are looking up. Let me try something else now. Moving up the current path, the next stop would be the overhead switch. There might be a bit of oxidation there too. I'll grab some contact cleaner and I'm going to give it a squirt, then wiggle the lever around a bit. Now, let's see if that helped. No, it's still not right. But if I wiggle the logo or I apply some pressure on the lever, we manage to get some motion. Right, I think it's safe to assume the decoder is fine now and that we only have a contact problem somewhere. So I will park this problem for now and I'll do a full service so I have a better base to work from. I won't cover the full maintenance here, uh, just a few model specific points and stuff I came across here and there. So the motor bogey clamp wasn't fitted properly and it was dangerously close to the gears. It might have caused some drag or even prevented motion. On this model, to lift the bogey from the chassis, we need to navigate around the light fitting. It cannot be removed easily, so some of the wiring needs to be moved to the side instead. The capacitors on the motor plate are also used for cable management and they need to be gently lifted, just enough so the wires can be moved past it. I say gently because the legs of these components are fragile and will break if they have been moved a bit aggressively a few times already. So this will avoid having to break the soldering iron out. And the rest of the maintenance was really uneven full on this model, just the normal stuff. So let's assess where we are now with our fresh chassis. Well, this hasn't done much. Same thing. We still have our contact issue. So after that, I decided to go scientific and broke the multimeter out. And I started poking around, which sent me down the wrong path. I thought for a while that my problem was the overhead lever. But after plenty of cleaning, bending and some more poking, I ended up in the same place. But looking back at what I'd been doing by trying to put pressure on the lever when the locomotive was on the track, I was also pushing the chassis. And what moves with the chassis? The front bogey, of course. I had cleaned the wheels, so the only element that could have caused the intermittent contact there could only be the pickup shoe. It's bizarre because it looked to be in a very good shape, but to eliminate any problem there, I grabbed another one to see if it changed anything. And it did! So the problem had been staring me in the face all along. How typical. And it was finally time for reassembly. And there we are on the track. The model can still move. Let me change the direction and we'll send it forward. And now backwards. OK. As I was watching this footage during editing, I realized we had one remaining issue. Let's replay it. Listen to the motor. You should hear it cut off. Now let's move the locomotive backwards. And again, the loco cuts off when the bogey closest to us goes over a switching track. 
and that's the bogey where the pickup shoe is attached to. Now this shouldn't happen. Uh, the pickup shoe should be able to push the lever on the switching track and maintain contact with the track in the process. And I think what's happening here is the opposite. This means that the uh, springs on the pickup shoe we fitted are not strong enough or out of shape and we need to adjust this. Unfortunately, I forgot to press record on my camera when doing my adjustments, so here's a reenactment using the pickup shoe I removed earlier. I remove the slider to access the spring, then I'll simply bend each side of the spring down a bit, trying to keep uh, the same angle on both sides. And once done, I'll reattach the slider. Now this will increase the pressure of the pickup shoe against the track. The pickup shoe fitted to the loco now has been adjusted this way, so let's send it on the track again. And it now manages the switching track with no interruption. Let's go backwards to make sure this wasn't a fluke. Problem solved! Okay. Now the maintenance is complete, we have a model that's come back to life, which I'm going to put aside until it's running. Time for the next patient! And here's the newest of them in the collection. It is a 3553. It's got a 5-star propulsion system, as Merklin called it. So let's get it out of its box. It has the same roof arrangement as the previous one. Obviously, it is now in a different livery. I did a video about this livery recently. I've put a little link at the top if you're interested. Now, let's put it on the track. Ah, this one's working. There is no acceleration delay set by the looks of it. But it doesn't sound too bad. So it should be easier than what we have seen so far. So we're going to check the chassis. Tires first, loose, 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 and loose again. So we'll need another full set of tires. The rest of the chassis looks fine. Right, let's get into the loco. The screw is a bit stiff here, and the larger screwdriver I normally use to deal with this type of things doesn't fit. So brute force it is going to have to be. Let's hope for the best. There oh. we are. Let's have a look at the inside. It all looks familiar, but there are a few differences. Inside what looks like a standard AC motor we should have a 5-pole armature. Uh, we have the standard overhead lever switch in the center, and we have something that looks like a decoder, but isn't one. On the other side, it's an intelligent reverser that provides motor regulation. Uh, you can set the acceleration delay and max speed using the two potentiometers on the board. As with other electronic reversers, the AC current from the track is converted to direct current before being fed to the motor and lighting. So the motor and lighting circuits are electrically isolated from the chassis, so it's the same as with uh, 3300 series and digital locomotives. Why DC? Because it's easier to control than AC when you start doing stuff like motor regulation. OK, based on what we have seen so far, all this loco needs is a good service and an adjustment of the 5-star delay and max speed settings. Again, I'll skip the servicing steps and concentrate on a few points I had to address with this loco. First of all, we had congealed or resinified oil. Look at the screw and screw holes for the clamp. Secondly, we have a similar cable management solution as on the digital model. Uh, 
So the capacitor needs to be lifted just enough to allow the wires to slide past and move to the side of the bogey so it can be lifted out. Here's now a view of the 5-pole armature. As a note, it has a larger diameter than the ones used for digital, so the parts are not interchangeable. As I was checking the bogey, I found yet more resinification with a very sluggish axle. Look at that! I used the technique I described in my video about seized locomotive. There's another link at the top if you're interested. So I used a bit of WD-40 in the motor housing to get things going. After a couple of squirts, everything was moving freely again. And the rest was identical to what I showed on the 3153 in the previous video. After a few minutes, we had another freshly serviced chassis and new traction tires. Now, let's have a look at the 5 star settings. We have two potentiometers on the board. The first one sets the maximum speed and the second one the acceleration delay. Maximum speed is often misunderstood. It's not the same as digital. What this board does is monitor the voltage used by the motor and compares it to the voltage it receives from the transformer. When the load on the motor changes, it causes the voltage to change on the circuit. So a load increase, for example, will cause a voltage drop. The board will notice that and amplify the voltage it feeds to the motor to compensate for the drop. And this will allow more current to flow to the motor, which will help it maintain a more even speed. So this only works within a certain margin. I think it's plus or minus 15% compared to the base voltage provided by the transformer. But it provides noticeable effects on curves and whilst climbing ramps. But it's not the same behavior as the motor regulation you'd get with the modern digital logo. What does work nicely with the 5-pole motor is the slow speed behavior and the acceleration delay effect is quite good too. So I have changed the setting. They were both set to fast maximum speed and fast acceleration. So no delay. The potentiometer dial has a flat side, which helps identify the setting roughly. The wiper for the potentiometer is located on the opposite side. So I have changed the acceleration settings to just under 50%. And the max speed is set to around 60% of the uh, available uh, regulation. So I'll do a final bit of cable management, putting the wires back where I found them. And I'll put the body back on. Quick test. Transformer at 130, 140. See, the loco gradually accelerates. Cool. All that thing needs now is a run-in. All we have left to do now is to have a look at the rescue dog in this lot. I think it should be okay because I used it not so long ago. Uh, see, I have no paperwork or in-tray for this one. This was a surprise auction win at a very, very low price. I think the postage was more expensive than the loco if I remember well. It had all sorts of things wrong with it, starting with a broken pantograph and also a gutted interior. Let me check the tyres. <laughs> Unbelievable! I need new ones here too. Now let's have a look inside. See, I had to reinstate a reverser and an electronic pre-reversing unit. I had used the diagrams from the Meckling website as a guide, but I think the locomotive came with an all-in-one electronic reverser, like this one.
The instructions available to download from the Merklin website are not complete for anything prior to, uh, I think, 2000. So it could be that uh, they don't have the right set of instructions for this model. Anyway, the problem with these electronic uh, pre-reversing units is that uh, when something goes wrong on the model, people get confused because they're wired differently and uh, they often end up ripping most of it out and reinstated in a traditional analog configuration instead. Now, a little note about uh, this uh, model. Uh, as Merklin models from that era go, this is probably one of the cheapest to get, and it's really not difficult to find. Uh, the same cannot be said about some of its spare parts. For example, the black pentagraphs used on the red versions of the BR120 were only made for a few years, and they are easily three or four times more expensive than more common types when they come up for sale, if at all. Now, this can quickly add up to more than 30 or 40% of the retail value of the model. So if you're looking for one of these, it is really important to check every minute detail before buying and make sure you get the best you can for your money, as anything you'd have to do to it would really not make any economical sense, at least for now, the locomotive hasn't appreciated in value at all. Okay, we've done our checks, we've done the tire replacements, uh, the logo won't need anything more doing to it, not even a run-in as I used it fairly recently. So I'll put it aside and I'm going to get the other three set up on a small block system, which I will use to let them have their run-in for a few minutes. There we go. I can now start work on the video I wanted to make about the BR120. I hope I have enough rolling stock. But that is another question. So, that was it for today. I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I hope you found the video interesting or helpful. Hopefully enough to give it a thumbs up and maybe hit the subscribe button. Many thanks for staying with me that far and Bye for now.